Hello there. Triumphant Somali interim government troops backed by their Ethiopian allies have marched into Mogadishu. Islamic courts fighters had abandoned the city just hours earlier after more than a week of heavy fighting throughout the country. The Ethiopian prime minister has vowed to pursue Islamic courts leaders who are fleeing to the south. John Cookson has this on the day's dramatic developments. Looters took to the streets of Mogadishu where there's no one in charge, no rule of law. As fighters of the Islamic courts retreated from the Somali capital, the city descended into anarchy and gunfire. This man said security was tight before but fighting broke out again today. I don't know where the militias and officials have gone. Young men ran in the streets carrying away whatever they could, including hospital intravenous drips pieces of furniture and mattresses. Earlier, the Islamic courts said they'd fight to the death, but then ordered their fighters to leave the capital to save the people from being caught in the crossfire. We have withdrawn all the leaders and members of Islamic courts from Mogadishu. We will, God's willing, push all these invading troops out of Somalia. We have a plan to drive them out of here. Pro-government forces had already seized the key southern town of Jauha from the fighters of the court's movement. Families left their homes to cheer the victors as Ethiopian tanks pursued retreating Islamist fighters. Fighting had been fierce. Doctors patched up the injured as best they could with limited medical supplies. And the people of Jauha had earlier freed prisoners from the Islamic court's movement. The African Union and other members of the international community are urging Ethiopia to withdraw its forces, but that won't happen yet. The uh, forces of the transitional government uh, and Ethiopia are in the outskirts of uh, Mogadishu now. Uh, we are discussing as to what we need to do to make sure that uh, uh, Mogadishu does not descend into chaos. The Somali capital is now in a dangerous power vacuum and the first thing government forces have to do is to restore some sort of law and order. John Cookson, Al Jazeera. Now our Somali correspondent Mohamed Addo is in Nairobi. He says Mogadishu could easily descend into chaos and violence if the interim government is not careful. Well, it depends on how the government, uh, the, the interim government in Baidoa, right uh, at, at the moment, handles the situation. Right now, the Prime Minister is said to be getting into the city with the forces of the government. There have been also some representation from the government in terms of the Deputy Prime Minister and Interior Minister Hussein Mohammed Aidid, who is said to be in the city trying to talk to clan elders about uh, getting their support for the government. It all depends on what the outcome of these talks with the clan elders is. But I, uh, uh, the, the, there is one thing that is for sure, that there are many in Mogadishu who are itching to have uh, an unru uh, unruly Mogadishu, chaotic Mogadishu, so that they have a field day that they used to have. It all depends on how the government plays its cards at the moment. Meanwhile, up to 165 people are feared to have drowned after four boats from Somalia capsized off the coast of Yemen. The UNHCR says 500 people were on board the boats from Basaso in northeast Somalia, headed across the Gulf of Aden to, to Yemen. Twelve bodies have been retrieved so far, but 140 are still missing. In other news, at least 23 people have been killed and 70 more are injured in bombings across Baghdad. In the latest attack, a bomb planted under a car near the Al-Shab Stadium killed 12 people as they queued to buy kerosene. Earlier, two roadside bombs killed nine and injured 43 others in central Baghdad. The bombs exploded in the capital's Southgate district, an area usually packed with shoppers and commuters. Internet connections and phone lines are slowly being restored in Asia following Tuesday's earthquake off Taiwan. Repairs are being carried out on undersea data cables which were damaged during the tremor. Yes, the cables carry traffic between China, Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, the United States and Taiwan. Now the ripple effect of the cable damage extends far beyond the earthquake zone as far away as the United States and Australia for companies whose internet is routed through those affected areas. Kath Turner reports now on moves to bring Southeast Asia back 
into the 21st century. The cause of widespread telecommunication disruption across much of Asia lies on the floor of the Pacific Ocean. Up to a dozen underwater fibre optic cables were broken by an earthquake off Taiwan's south coast on Tuesday, which was followed by a powerful aftershock. The cables are less than two centimetres thick and extremely vulnerable. Optic fibres are fragile. A small amount of force will be able to crack them. A light transfer insight will be affected. Telecommunication companies are scrambling to adopt emergency measures such as renting transmission capacity from private cable operators. Some businesses have been crippled by the shutdown, others are continuing, albeit at a crawl. The internet problem might slow down some orders which were placed through online channels, but I don't think the overall market transactions will be adversely affected. More repair crews are on their way, but they can't come soon enough. There will be three cable ships arriving in the area near Pintong. Cable ships from Japan, Singapore and the United Kingdom will arrive to repair simultaneously and it is expected to be completed in two to three weeks' time. That means one of the world's most technologically advanced regions will remain offline for some time yet. Kath Turner, Al Jazeera. Indonesia now. Relief supplies are trickling into remote areas of western Indonesia. Authorities are trying to reach more survivors displaced by severe flooding and landslides. But heavy rain is still complicating aid delivery in the hardest hit Aceh province. Taimur Nabili has this report. Vast areas of northwestern Indonesia are now underwater and remote areas remain cut off. But days after the flooding hit, people are slowly returning to what is left of their homes. Medical aid is at last arriving and the sick are being attended to. But providing food and shelter for the homeless is still a major struggle as heavy rains continue to fall, cutting off roads and hampering relief efforts. In the more remote areas, many people don't even have access to the most basic of necessities. We don't have any drinking pumps. We boil the water from the well. Treatment of polluted wells is underway and government teams are fogging the temporary camps with insecticide. This disaster has been the result of an unusually wet rainy season made worse by deforestation of the area, which has led to huge mudslides. While the tsunami two years ago was a natural disaster, people are saying this one could have been avoided. Taimur Nabili, Al Jazeera. Israel has rejected reports that it's building a new settlement in the Jordan Valley, but a member from the group Settlement Watch has told Al Jazeera it is, and it's doing so by replacing a military site. Well, earlier, my colleague Sami Zaydan spoke to Kalev Ben David from the Israel Project and asked him whether Israel was violating any international obligations. It isn't, because again, you know, people are talking about the roadmap here, because, but the roadmap will only go into effect when we see coordinated steps also on the Palestinian side, and that, of course, has to start with the cessation of terrorism. But, you know, it's true that Israel has said that it will negotiate over the settlements. You, but it has. Uh, that isn't the way that your st closest ally, the United States, sees it. I would just like to read you a statement here made by... Gonzo Gallagher, a sure. State Department spokesman, who said the establishment of a new settlement or the expansion of an existing settlement would violate Israel's obligations under the roadmap. Is the United States wrong as yes, well? Yes, but we are... Uh, no, but uh, that statement on itself is correct. But we are not yet in the roadmap. The roadmap is actually supposed well, they to seem start to think so. with steps taking on on both sides. Well, I can't. I can only really hear speak from the side from the Israeli perspective. Again, but look at the roadmap itself. Look at the text of the roadmap itself. The, one of the reasons Israel agreed to the roadmap as opposed to other existing peace plans was because it calls for parallel steps being taken on both sides in order to get underway, including the cessation of terrorism. We're not in the roadmap yet. Uh, we, uh, it's on paper, but we're not there yet.